me second now. Yep. Give me a second now. That's why I wanted to start recording before. <laughs> <laughs> and this one you want to use air because that would skip through whole sections. Spacebar closes it down. Unless there's just a glitch at one time that closed it down on me and I did that. So it's the space it's the arrow keys on this one.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody as we're gathered together this morning as we worship, as we praise, we thank God for all the things that he's given and blessed us. We have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we're looking for any graduation bios that could happen. Got a little hollow stuff on that. Uh, for any information on anybody graduating high school, college, anything of that nature, uh, if you just send us the information, we'd like to put that together uh, for a bulletin as we come up into June for all of those that are graduating. So if, we could just, if you would just uh, send us that information, that would be wonderful. Uh, also, next Sunday is when we're going to be having our volunteer appreciation. So that would be a uh, time just to thank everybody for all of what we what has gone on this year as we're gathered together in his name. Uh, also this next week, the Mobs Group is going to be meeting here at uh, Berea, 9.30 to 11.30, the Mother of Preschoolers. Uh, a couple of things, looking for volunteers that might be willing to step forward here. Uh, one of them is to kind of help the uh, support group for a before and after care ministry that will be starting up in the fall. And secondly, uh, we're looking at our BBS that will be starting up at the end of June coming up here. And uh, we've already got, uh, I believe, about 10 people signed up for BBS over a month from now. So that would be a blessing. But if we already have about 10 signed up at this point, that means we're going to need a little bit more help as we go forward. So it'll be in the morning. Uh, and anybody that would be willing to help, it would be an incredible blessing as we go forward. And uh, last note, as we're gathered together here, uh, part of us as we're gathered together and right after the service, We'll be meeting in the fireside room. Uh, this is the 67th wedding anniversary for Bill and Louise Bender. Did I pronounce that right? We'll go with that. Excellent. And so as we go throughout our service this morning, uh, a couple of things. The opening hymn is kind of a, kind of, it is a uh, wedding, a marriage hymn, kind of remembering when God brings two together. And he's given 67 incredible years together. That's an awesome thing going forward. Uh, and also, we'll have a couple of uh, pieces of music that will be sung by AJ and Brianna throughout this, kind of uh, uh, celebrating also the 67th wedding anniversary this morning also. Are there any other announcements this morning? Either I covered them all, or you don't want to hear my voice anymore. Either one's good. So please rise as we greet one another.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, forgiveness. therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition, together as his people. Let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sin. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake, forgives you of all your sins. As I call on your name, servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray together. Lord, because you have promised to give what we ask in the name of your only begotten Son, teach us rightly to pray. And with all your saints, and all your adoration and praise, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
The epistle lesson is from 1 Peter 3, 13-22. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely, safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we see our sermon.
sake, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Now let us take a small to look throughout Scripture and find ways that are kind of surprising and how the Lord works and how He makes things happen that need to take place. Because a lot of times we have our way of what's going to go forward. We have our plans. We have our ways of going forward. We think that this is going to happen. I'm going to go forward and then I'm going to go to school and then to college and then to seminary and then to be a pastor in this place. And all of a sudden, God starts to bring you somewhere else. You have all of these plans. This is exactly how things are going to happen. And next thing you know, everything is different. And God's still at work. God's still making it all happen. But the ways that he seems to work seem to be different than what we have planned and what we have set forward. In our reading for today, it really kind of starts with Paul. Because Paul had just been on this incredible mission journey. And he had his own concepts and thoughts of where he was going to go. He was going to go off into Asia Minor, think modern day Turkey. And as he was off in that area, he was going to go to place to place to place. He was going to go to this town, preach the word of the Lord. Everybody was going to hear. And everybody was going to believe. And all of a sudden, you had this incredible strong church right there. He'd hope to get it started. He'd get it on a good founding, a good footing. Then he'd go off to someplace else. He had this idea of what would happen. Like in Corinthians, where he would go and he'd spend some time there with them. Get things set. Get things forward. Spend more than spend two to three years there. And finally move on from there. And with all of that happening, that was his plan. To go place to place to place. And everybody would hear. <coughs> but as soon as he started, before he could do it, people were rejecting his words. People were having him brought out and stoned. They were chasing him. He finally comes to a place where he's able to share the word of the Lord. And he gets to this place, Berea. You know a place called Berea. So he finally gets to a place. He gets to Berea. He starts to share the word of the Lord with those that are in Berea. And they hear the word. And all of a sudden, they start asking him these questions. And just like as he would want, not only did he just accept it, they keep going into the word deeper and deeper and deeper. To say, is what this Paul guy saying really true? And he starts to get kind of excited. We get together and keep talking about Jesus and sharing in his word. And then the next thing you know, people are actually going from town to town and following after him to try and stop him from doing what he's doing. In fact, as he's there at Berea, and the people are just sponging in this incredible gospel message that had just been shared, sponging in the incredible word of the Lord. All of a sudden, people from his previous places that he'd gone and shared the word come forward and try to stir up trouble for him, probably to try to get him arrested or worse. And so he has to leave again. Not his plan, not his way of going forward, but he has to leave again and again and again. And they bring him to Athens. They bring him to kind of the center of all Greek culture, if you're going to put it forward. And so he gets there in Athens, and again he has kind of a plan. His plan is, okay, well I have to run, I'll go to Athens, I'll just kind of wait right there, and then you all will catch up and we'll decide what our next step is going to be. In fact, that's what we see right there in our text. Now Paul was waiting for them in Athens. That was his beginning plan. I'm going to go to Athens, let my body heal up after all of what's happened. I'll let myself just kind of recuperate, and I'll wait for everybody else to get here. And then when all the rest are together, and once the gang and the band is back together, then we'll go forward, and we'll decide what's the next step. And we'll do it in prayer. We'll have the Holy Spirit there. But his plan was, we'll wait here till everybody else comes forward. Well, a lot of times in our life, that wasn't God's plan, was it? His plan and God's plan were not exactly the same. And so you get those next words that go forward there. And his spirit was provoked within him. And he saw the city was full of idols. 
So as he's there, going away, going to take just a couple of weeks and breathe. He sees what's going on. He sees all these idols all over the city of Athens. And his spirit is provoked. And you can kind of think, using words together a little bit, but the Holy Spirit is the one provoking his spirit. And say, Paul, you can't just sit here and wait. This is set up before you ahead of time. Time to go forward and do what I have set before you. And so as Paul is gathered together, he sees this and it's all fulfilled with idols. So he decides, well, I'll just go out and share. And so the first place, he kind of has two things that he does. The first one is one to hear again and again and again. He goes straight to the synagogue. He goes straight to his people. He goes straight to the people that know the Old Testament scriptures. The people who know Genesis all the way through the prophets. The people who have the Psalms memorized by heart. The people who have heard the last parts of Isaiah that talk about the suffering servant. And Paul goes there. And he's kind of excited. Because as I'm here, you know of the promised suffering servant. Let me explain to you how this in the end of Isaiah, is talking about what Jesus did as he suffered and died on that cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. So he goes to the synagogue and shares it there. But everybody doesn't hang out in the synagogue all day. So he just goes off to the marketplace. And I love this part of this verse. He goes to the marketplace, starts to share every day with those who happen to be there. That doesn't sound like a really good plan, does it? Our plan that we would go forward is, okay, I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to talk to that person, I'm going to go over here. Instead, Paul just goes down to the market, because the place he was comfortable with. You remember, Paul was a tent maker. He made tents, he sold tents, that's how he made his living. You could kind of put, in another word, what was kind of Paul's job as a tent maker? was a small business. And so he was very familiar with this whole scene of being in the marketplace. So as he gathers in that marketplace, just as he's there, whomever he happens to find, he shares the word of the Lord with. Whoever happens to be in front of him, he just starts to talk and to share and let them know of what God has done. Not exactly what we would think of as a plan and how God makes it happen. And as he's there, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others say, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. He was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now this is something kind of for us to be careful and think about on this passage right here. Because Paul, he had been called by the Lord, right? In fact, he'd been called by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And the Lord had walked with him. The Lord had taught him, trained him, humbled him. The Lord had done all sorts of things right there for that apostle. And as the apostle to the Gentiles is out there amongst the Gentiles, sharing the word of the Lord, he just starts preaching. And the words that he's preaching, something we would gather really quick, right? Jesus, he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And we all understand that, right? We all get exactly what Paul was getting to. He was talking about Jesus who died on the cross. And that he was raised from the dead. And by Jesus' death and his resurrection, all our sins are accounted for. And heaven is our home. We get that, right? We know that's exactly what Paul was saying. But what about the people that were listening to Paul? We get it. Did those Athenians get it? It seems like they didn't quite get it. They were a little bit confused, right? And look at that second line there. He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. It's a plural. Not a foreign divinity, a foreign god. Foreign gods. Why would they have gotten this idea? 
that Jesus was preaching about, or that Jesus, uh, Paul was preaching about multiple gods. Look at the words there. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. In Greek, the Greek word for resurrection, Anastasia. So they were hearing this words. Jesus and the resurrection, which we get off of the bat right away. We know what Paul was talking about. But they heard those words. And we get so well. And they took the resurrection. That must be a different God that he must be preaching about. You see how easy it is when we're sharing the gospel? For things to kind of get turned around? And it's not people trying to twist it just to twist it. But sometimes we can just be talking as a Christian. And stating things that we know so well. And then other people get confused. They start to get wondering, what in the world are you talking about? Or they might use the words up there, what is this you're babbling on about? I don't get it. So kind of as we're talking, and as we share that gospel message, we got to take care. And as we share, we don't use in-house language. If you're sharing the gospel with somebody, it might seem obvious. We don't go and say, well, let me tell you about the justification for your sins that leads to sanctification. And while we're at it, let's talk about the dual nature of Christ being Son of Man and Son of God. Now, almost all of you got exactly what I just said there. But nobody that doesn't know the faith knows that. Now that would be kind of a high-end example using as many $20 words as we can think of. But even if you're just saved, we are saved by Jesus. If you talk to someone that doesn't know the faith, you really need to explain even that of what's going on. What does it mean that somebody might be saved? There's so much that needs to be shared there. To save and salvation that we all get. Something the world doesn't quite understand. And how can that be through Jesus? We know that as we share this incredible faith that God has given to us, that's got so much depth. That's kind of one of the traps that sometimes we run into, isn't it? Because we've been immersed in this for so long. We've heard the word of the Lord so often. You can even run into the trap of saying, now after, after the worship service, we're going to meet for a time of fellowship as we celebrate the 67th wedding anniversary in the fireside. Because everybody knows the fireside room is, right? Even calling, we'll meet in the fireside room ends up being kind of in-house language as we gather together. Now hopefully people will kind of come in, see a fire there, and kind of poke two and two together. But not always. So as we're sharing the gospel, we got to watch out for some of that in-house language, which is kind of what Paul was doing. But praise be the Lord, it doesn't rest on us. And the Holy Spirit is very much an act of a lot of times, despite us. And so it continues on. And they took him, Paul, and brought him to the uh, Areopagus. They brought him to an Areopagus, Areo, Ares, who was the Greek god of war. They brought him up to a place called Mars Hill. Because that's where, and this is where you get to some interesting things. May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. We want to know what these things mean. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul had gone to the marketplace. He had gone to kind of his comfort zone, where he felt comfortable. Now, they were bullying him where he wasn't as comfortable. They were bullying him in front of the people. Get, you get what's going on here? They brought Paul in front of the people who did nothing all day but hear new things and argue new things. Does that sound like a place where you want to go tell? If you were going to go and tell the good news about Jesus, would you want to go tell? Remember, he's still alone. 
Would you like to go there, be the only person, and then have about 50 people around you who have been training themselves in arguing against stuff? Does that sound like a good time? But praise be to God by the Holy Spirit. Paul is brought to that place. And he starts to share the word of the Lord. Because he doesn't hear all of the scary stuff that would go through our minds, right? He doesn't hear all of what's going to go forward. He just goes forward. This is where the Holy Spirit is leading me. This is where we're going to be in. So he goes and he starts to preach. And as he goes forward, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. That's how he begins. Now remember, his heart had been stirred because of all these idols that he had seen all over the place. They were worshiping Mars. They were worshiping Aphrodite. They were worshiping just about every god that you can imagine out there. In fact, they wanted so much to cover every single base. They had that one statue to the unknown god. So as he's going along there, he sees all these gods that are around there. And the hill that he's going to be on is the god of war's <coughs> hill there in Athens. So he gathers together there. And you notice he follows kind of what Peter was saying. As Peter was saying, always be ready to give a witness for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. But do it with gentleness and respect. You notice as Paul starts to witness and starts to share the gospel, he doesn't come forward and say, You idiots! These things are stoned and you're worshiping them. Get a clue. Is that how Paul starts? He starts, as Peter says in our epistle text, with gentleness and respect. He says, I see that you are very religious. In our American context, we would say, I see that you are very spiritual. It's kind of the word that we put in there. Very spiritual. And in American context, being very spiritual tends to imply that I'll take a little bit of this for my spirituality, a little bit of that for my spirituality, and I'll put together my own spirituality as I go forward. And he goes forward. And he kind of does it with respect. I see that you are very spiritual as you go forward. Or I pass along. And it almost seems to be like he's walking to there. It doesn't quite say that this is the case. But it seems to be as though he's walking there. He sees that statue to the unknown God. And he's looking at that statue to the unknown God. Which, by the way, in the Bible is not the only place we find reference to that statue. We find at least three other places in ancient literature that also refer to that same statue to the unknown God. Because they're worshiping all these gods. But there might be one they don't get. And they want to make that one happy too. So we'll have one to everything. If we happen to miss something, and will go forward. And then Paul goes forward and he uses an idol as an example to kind of start to share the word. He's coming with gentleness and respect as he shares this incredible good news which has been given and granted to us. And as he goes throughout the rest of this sermon, he starts to talk about the, this unknown God that you don't get is the creator of the universe. And not only is the creator of the universe, but he is close by us as well. Because Paul goes forward, he talks about their spirituality. He comes forward in humbleness and respect. But he sees exactly what's going on, which is something that we humans are very good at. We like to take something and have control. We like to take what might be happening, put it in a box so we know where it's at. And we can have it where we want it to be. And the Greeks were very much going in this direction. They had their temples. And they wanted a God that wasn't way out here in charge of everything. 
But they didn't want him to be right here in person either. They wanted their gods to be up in Olympus. Or they wanted their gods to be sitting in a place separate from them. They wanted to have a certain amount of control over their gods. And if they could control their gods, if they could put them in a box, they could completely understand it and be in charge. Boy, does that happen in our world too. It's not just the ancient world. They try to put God into only Sunday morning. Or you put God in only this private place in your life. Or God only in this piece of where you live. And then the rest of your life is completely separate, right? So you've got this Jesus part, and then you've got this rest of your life that's separate and part. And as long as you can keep Jesus in this box, well, you can keep him away from everything else. And as Paul's going forward, that's what he's telling them. He's telling them on the one hand, this is a God that's so much more than you can imagine. He created the universe. But guess what? This God that is of all of creation is not far away. It's also right here with us. And as he continues to go through that, he points them to that cross and to Jesus who came into this world to be here for us. So sometimes we look at our Lord and we think, boy, this is all going in a strange way. I've got my plans, my ways of doing things. But God has His plans. And His plans that are so much greater than ours are put together there. And sometimes we don't get his plans. Because we can't put God into this box where it's separate from the rest of our lives. And we can't put God as far removed because we have a God who is here, who dwells with us, who walks with us. And where we get that word, very much using in-house language, our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise as we confess this common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, be of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, who was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, who was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory and judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the religion of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Maybe
amazing gift that you've placed in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of wedded light and for bringing Bill and Louise together and for helping them to celebrate this day, their 67th anniversary. We ask that you'll continually watch over them, bless them, and guide them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are sick, who are hurting, especially those in this fellowship. We pray, Lord, for Cindy, Dahia, Richard, Matthew, Delight, James, Mara, Vern, Peggy, Elaine, Shelley, Herman, Marge, Agnes, Nora, Gladys, Lou, and Phyllis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Watch over our friends and our family and all of our loved Especially we pray for Cassie, Chelsea, Kathy, Dick, Carolyn, Joan, Jackie, Art, Lorraine, and Jean. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over, Lord, all of those who have lost loved ones. Especially we pray for the family of Mabel Kozar and the family of our Villa Manuka. We ask that you will watch over them, send them a special measure of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you watch over all of those who are far from home. Be with those who share your word, especially lift up Katie, Josh, Ruth, and their family. Watch over all of our military personnel as they are stationed throughout this world. Bless them, keep them in their duty, and especially lift Andrew up into your hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you watch over all of our elected leaders. We ask that you will guide them, lead them. We ask that you might grant them a servant's heart. Give them, Lord, your wisdom and the strength to follow where you lead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray the word the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which you betrayed, took bread, and when you gave thanks, he gave and said, Take, eat, it's my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same manner also in the cup after supper. When he gave thanks, he gave them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This goes off as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. you may be seen.
body and blood, strength preserving the true faith to life everlasting. Pardon? Yes. Amen. Amen. He prayed. Give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with the salutary gift. I implore you your mercy, to strengthen us in faith towards you and love toward one another. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing together our closing hymn. He is risen, glorious work.